Brethren, welcome to Shabbat services, and today is the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and as we celebrate this high day, the vast majority of the Christian faith are preparing for Easter, for the Easter weekend. And as we've studied many times before, we understand that the, the vast majority of Christianity has been deceived, they are worshipping the goddess Ishtar, and we have drawn away from that, we've come out of that corruption, we've come out of that deception. And we obviously have just celebrated the Last Supper, we have celebrated the Passover, we have eaten unleavened bread for seven days, and we are now on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And at many times throughout this last week, and a, uh, just over a week of, of observances, we have related Yehoshua to the Passover sacrifice. But the question that we should ask is, can we prove, can we really prove that Yehoshua is the Messiah? Is there anything that he did that we can study to say, yes, absolutely, what he did fulfilled the requirements of the Messiah? And if we can prove that, then we can see how his whole ministry comes together. So what I'd like to do this Sabbath is start looking at the subject of proving that Yehoshua is the Messiah, and then from there, uh, we will look at some of the prophetic fulfillments and how this Passover season demonstrated, or how he demonstrated all of these prophetic fulfillments during this Passover season. So let's start by turning to the Gospel of Matthew. And we go to Matthew chapter 12, and we will start in verse 38. Matthew 12, starting in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of, of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. So obviously this, this sign of three days is how we get the Christian uh, celebration of Sunday, uh, the day that he was resurrected, and obviously he was, uh, he was killed on Good Friday, three days later is Sunday, so that's when he was resurrected. But is that what the scripture actually says? Let's look in detail and see what the scripture says. Verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now we know from scriptures that he died at three o'clock in the afternoon. We're told that on Good Friday, the day before the Sabbath, he died at three o'clock in the afternoon. So if we add on three days and three nights, let's see where we get to. Friday afternoon, add the first night, takes us to three o'clock Saturday morning, another 12 hours for the daytime period is three o'clock Saturday afternoon, another 12 hours takes us to three o'clock Sunday morning, another 12 hours is three o'clock Sunday afternoon, another 12 hours is three o'clock Monday morning, and the last 12 hour period is three o'clock Monday afternoon. So if we see the sign that justifies that Yehoshua was indeed the Messiah three days and three nights in the earth, then people who count on a Friday and use this to justify changing the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday are actually worshipping on the wrong day. They should be worshipping on the Monday. Or, if he was actually resurrected on the Sunday, which is the justification for why they worship, he is not the Messiah. The scripture says very clearly, three days and three nights he shall be in the ground. So if he died at 3 o'clock Friday afternoon and was resurrected before 3 o'clock Monday afternoon, he is not the Messiah. If he was resurrected on a Monday, why does mainstream Christianity worship on a Sunday? That's the day they say he was resurrected. 
or was he actually executed on a Friday? Let's look at the scriptures and let's prove all things. Let's go to Matthew 28 and we will start in verse 1. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was beginning to, I'm sorry, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of Jehovah descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Yehoshua who was executed. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the master lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples' word. So, this is obviously the first evidence that the, the followers had that Yehoshua had risen. And let's look at some of the detail from that scripture. In verse 1 it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to see the sepulcher. So this scripture tells us it was the dawn period of the first day of the week. Now we know from our studies in the past that at this time of year, in Israel, sunrise and sunset are about 12 hours apart. It's about 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. That is when these events were occurring. So as the first day of the week began to dawn, it would be somewhere around about 5.30, quarter to 6 in the morning as the women came to the tomb. So very, very early on the first day of the week. The Sabbath obviously finished at sunset the previous day. There was the nighttime portion, and now we have the dawning of the daytime portion of the first day of the week. So let's see what things they were doing at this period. Let's turn to Mark chapter 16, and let us understand what was happening at this time. Mark 16, and we will start in verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man, clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Yehoshua of Nazareth, who was executed. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So let's look at what we saw in that scripture. In verse 1 it says this, And when the Sabbath was passed, and that ties in with what we just read in Matthew. In Matthew it said, The Sabbath being ended, and as the first day dawned. So we see that these, these two scriptures are lining up. And then it says, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And in verse 2 it says, And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. So here we can see a second witness. The women went to the tomb very early on the Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, as the sun was rising. So the Sabbath finished in the evening portion of the Sabbath day. There was the nighttime period of the first day. And now this is the dawning of the first day of the week. And it says also that they had bought spices that they might come and anoint him. So this is an important scripture, it's one we need to bear in mind as we move forward. So let us continue into the Gospel of Luke, and let us look at what Luke tells us about these events. Let's go to Luke chapter 23, 
and we will start in verse 50. Luke 23, and we will start in verse 50. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man, and he had not consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of the Mighty One. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Yehoshua. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation day, and the Sabbath drew near. And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the master Yehoshua. And it happened as they, great, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be executed, and the third day rise again. So here again we get a bit more information. In 24 and verse 1 it says, now upon the first of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. So again, we know that this is early on the first day of the week, the Sabbath has just ended, but it says they have prepared spices before that time. And in chapter 23 and verse 56 it says, And they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So the question that we have to ask is, when did they have the opportunity to buy, to buy the spices? He was on the stake till three o'clock in the afternoon. That was the preparation day before the Passover. The Passover was starting about six o'clock that evening. They had to buy spices and they had to prepare them. They had to make the ointment. They had to soak the bandages in the ointment. So there was a lot of work for them to do before they could, they could complete the anointing process. So the question we need to answer is, did they have enough time from Yehoshua dying on the stake at three o'clock on the afternoon to having all this work done before the Passover started at six o'clock that night? Was there enough time for them to do that? Well, let's see what other scriptures tell us. From the information that we've been given so far, we see that there is a Sabbath day. After the Sabbath day, it's the first day of the week. And it says in Matthew 16.2, early on the first day of the week, and in Luke 24.1, early on the first day of the week, they bring spices they had prepared. And in Luke 23 and 56, it says, they prepared spices and rested on the Sabbath day. So all of that is what the scripture tells us. What we don't understand is how they can have had time to go and buy these spices, prepare them, make the ointment, prepare the linen, and get the anointing ready, in the period from him being on the stake at three o'clock in the afternoon to the Passover starting at six o'clock that evening. So let's turn forward to the Gospel of John and let us see if John can give us any more information on this period. John chapter 19 and we will start in verse 28. John 19, starting in verse 28. After this, Yehoshua, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Yehoshua had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And, having his, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, 
that the body should not remain on the, on the stake on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that, that may, they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was executed with him. But when they came to Yehoshua, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who had, has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things are done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again another scripture says, they shall look on him who they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Yehoshua, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Yehoshua. And Pilate gave him permission, so that he came and took the body of Yehoshua. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Yehoshua by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Yehoshua and bound it in strips of linen with spices, as is the custom of the Jews to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Yehoshua because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So here we get a bit more detail that helps us put this story, this timeline together. In verse 42 it says, And they lay, they, there laid they Yehoshua, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the, pre, the sepulcher was nigh at hand. And in verse 31 it tells us this, The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the stake on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So here we see these things come together. And remember that Yehoshua died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We know it was the middle of the afternoon. We know he died at 3 o'clock. His side was pierced and blood and water came out. So his body had, his heart had stopped. The blood and the plasma was beginning to separate. So some time must have, must have elapsed between him dying, between him giving up his last breath and then having his side pierced. So if we think about Joseph of Arimathea going to, walking to see Pilate, having to get an audience, Pilate calling for the centurion, another hour or so has passed before Yehoshua uh, would have been proven to be dead by the Roman centurion. At that time, the centurion and the soldiers went and broke the legs of the other two prisoners, and that caused them to suffocate. So they wouldn't have had the strength to push their bodies up to to be able to inflate their lungs. So they would have suffocated fairly quickly after that time. So say it was now 4.30, so it's 5 o'clock by the time all three of the people who were executed that day were dead. That leaves just an hour before they can get this body into the tomb, otherwise they would be defiling the Passover, they'd be defiling the high day. The scripture tells us it is a high day, so it is a Sabbath, but not necessarily the weekly Sabbath. And obviously Nicodemus, who had not been at the, at the, uh, at the execution, because Nicodemus was, a, was afraid of the Jews, he had gone to Yehoshua secretly, came with this, with this anointing oil that he'd already prepared. So while the women were at the stake waiting for Yehoshua to die, Nicodemus could have been elsewhere preparing the anointing oil. So we can put this timeline together. If we start from the that the information we got in John 19 and 42, it says the Jews' preparation day. So that is the day prior to a Sabbath. And then in John 19 and verse 31, it says the Sabbath was a high day. And we also know that that high day from the other scriptures we've read was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover celebration was that evening, and then the, the daytime portion was when they remembered the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <coughs> then you get the statement that we had from Luke 20, 23 and 56. They prepared spices and rested on the Sabbath day. And in Mark 16, when the Sabbath was passed, they bought spices. So now we can see how this timeline comes together. 
the Sabbath that, that Mark is talking about was the first day of unleavened bread. There would have been no trading, no commerce. It was a, it was a high day, a, a set-apart convocation. On the day after the high day, the women went and bought the spices. And in some scripts it tells us they brought about 40 pounds of spices. So they had to grind and press these spices by hand. They had to make the, the ointment. They had to, to put this together to uh, soak it into the linen bandages that they used for the embalming process. So that would have taken a considerable amount of time to do it by hand. They did that on the day after the, uh, af after the first day of unleavened bread. Then it says um, they rested on the Sabbath day. So now it's talking about the weekly Sabbath. And then we see from the other scriptures, early on the first day of the week, bringing spices they had prepared, and in Mark it says, early on the first day of the week. So now we can see how the women can have bought the spices and rested on the Sabbath day and still have prepared the spices, because there are two Sabbaths that we're talking about in these scriptures. There is the weekly Sabbath and the annual Sabbath, the high day for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And if we go back through our calendars, we can tell that the Nisan 14 in the, in the Hebrew year 3790 was in fact the 3rd of April in AD 30, okay? And that was a Wednesday. So now if we look at this, we can see he actually was executed on the, on the Wednesday. The Thursday was the high day. The Friday was the preparation day for the weekly Sabbath, which is when they bought and prepared the spices. They rested on the weekly Sabbath, and then on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb and saw that he was resurrected, okay? And if we look at that and put that all together, we can see that Nisan 14 was the Wednesday, the preparation day. Yehoshua died in the ninth hour. Nisan 15 was a Thursday, which was the high day, the first day of unleavened bread. And it tells us that the Sabbath was a high day. And from 3 o'clock on the Wednesday afternoon to 3 o'clock on the Thursday afternoon is one day and one night. Then the Friday, Nisan 16, was a Friday. That is when the spices were prepared and the ladies rested for the Sabbath day. It tells us in Mark 16, when the Sabbath day was passed, they bought spices. So they bought spices on the Friday morning, they prepared them Friday afternoon, they rested for the weekly Sabbath. And then that period from Thursday afternoon, 3 o'clock, to Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, is the second day and night. Then we have the weekly Sabbath, and then the day after the Sabbath, you have early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And if you add this, the third day and night, that means that Yehoshua was not resurrected on Sunday morning, as we are told, as the mainstream Christian church will celebrate tomorrow at the Feast of Ishtar, but Yehoshua was in fact resurrected at three o'clock on the Sabbath afternoon, just before sundown on the Sabbath day. Okay? And the Sabbath is the day of rest of Yehovah. And we are told that six days we shall labor. So it would make sense, if you think about the great scheme of things, we rest on the Sabbath day, and then at the end of the Sabbath day, we go into our labor. Yehoshua rested in the ground for that three days and three nights. He was resurrected on the Sabbath day, and then he went to start his work his ministry now as the resurrected Messiah. So this all ties into Yehovah, all ties into his teachings and his expectations for us. And it also shows that by dying at three o'clock on the Wednesday afternoon and being resurrected at three o'clock Saturday, he fulfilled the sign of Messiah. Three days and three nights in the depth of the earth. If we follow mainstream Christian teaching that he died at three o'clock Friday afternoon, and he was resurrected on Sunday morning, we cannot be worshipping the Messiah. We must be worshipping a false god. Or, if we want to say that we worship the day of the week that he was resurrected on, and we say he died on Good Friday, the day of worship for mainstream Christianity should be a Monday. Or if they want to try and fiddle it so that they, they come back to the day of worship of the sun god, then they have to say he was, he was executed on a Thursday, but the scripture doesn't justify that because it said the, 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 the Sabbath was approaching, it was the day of preparation for the Sabbath. So no matter how you try and spin it, if you follow mainstream Christian doctrine, Yehoshua cannot be the Messiah 
for those who worship on the Sunday. They have been deceived. They are continuing in the deception, in the deception some knowingly, most in ignorance. But for us who have been given eyes to see and ears to hear, we can see clearly how the scriptures align to show exactly that Yahoshua fulfilled the signs. One sign I will give you that the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. One sign. The only sign that he gives us in the scripture is that he spent three days and three nights in the earth. And if he didn't do that, then he's not the Son of Man. He is not the Messiah. Okay? So, we can now see that Yahoshua fulfilled the Messiah. We can see how these scriptures came together. And we can see that the word of Yehovah is inerrant. Once we take the time to study and to think through what we're being told, we can see that the word of Yehovah is not in, in error. The error comes from our misunderstanding, our misinterpretation, or indeed in some cases, our mistranslation. But now we can see that Yehoshua has fulfilled the biblical requirements to be proven as the Messiah. Now, I'd just like to digress very slightly because this brings us to another, another one of the so-called mainstream Christian proof texts. So I just want to, to drop back to Luke 23 and verse 32. So we, we covered that before, so let's just pop back to Luke 23 and uh, let's look at verses 32 to 49. Luke 23, starting in verse 32. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they executed him, and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Yehoshua said, Father, forgive them, for they do not, they do not know what they do and they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah, the Chosen of the Mighty One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin and Hebrew, This is the King of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Messiah, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear the Mighty One, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Yahoshua, Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jehoshua said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now verse 43 is one of those proof texts that mainstream Christianity points to, to say that when we die we go to heaven. Verse 43 says this, And Yehoshua said to them, Verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What did we just study? In order for the Messiah, in, sorry, in order for Yehoshua to fulfill the sign that he is the Messiah, how long did he need to be in the belly of the earth? Three days and three nights. Yehoshua has just said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Is the earth paradise? Is the grave paradise? No, obviously not. Did Yehoshua go to heaven the day that he died? Not if he's going to fulfill the requirement to be the Messiah. Is this scripture a false scripture? No, it's not. What it is, it's a flawed translation. In the Greek, there is no punctuation. So when we read our English translations of the Bible, all the punctuation marks that we see in there are put in by the translators. After they've, after they've translated from the Greek to the English, they then go back and put in the punctuation that they feel makes most sense. So the scripture says, Verily I say unto thee, comma, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And for a Christian 
translator, that would make sense. They believe that you go to heaven when you die. But the, the position of that comma was just one man's interpretation. You could take the Greek and translate it as follows. And Jehoshua said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee today, comma, shall thou be with me in paradise? Now, is that grammatically correct? Yes. Verily, I say unto thee today, Jehoshua is on the stake, he's talking to the man who's been executed with him, Verily, I say unto thee today, yes, he's talking to him there and then, you shall be with me in paradise. Does it mean that when that man is resurrected and goes through the judgment, he will be in paradise? Yes, he has the chance. He repented on the stake. He came to repentance. So when he is resurrected, he will go to paradise. He may even be in the first resurrection, we don't know. But even if he comes up in the second resurrection, he will be able to enter into the kingdom. Okay? So the scripture is not wrong. The error here has come from the bias of the translator to try and make the scriptures fit their doctrine. Now, does this fit with our requirement that Yahushua spends three days and three nights in the grave? Well, yes, it does. Verily I say unto thee, today, comma, shall thou be with me in paradise. He can spend three days and three nights in the ground. He can spend 2,000 years waiting for the return of Messiah. He can spend a 1,000 years during the millennial reign. And still, that statement is true. Yehoshua spoke to him today and said, you will be with me in paradise. He didn't put a time on it. Okay? So the scripture is not flawed. What is flawed is man's bias when they translate the scriptures to suit their own doctrine. And we as Bible literalists, and we as the children of the light, and we as those whose eyes have been opened and, and whose ears have been unstopped, have an obligation to search the scriptures to prove all things. Okay? So this scripture holds if we correct the grammatical error made by the translator. Now there's another point, this is a, this is a great scripture because it gives us another clue about uh, errors in translation. In verse 38 it said, and a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the arguments most mainstream Christian seminaries, seminaries use for the, uh, the preeminence of the Greek text is they say that at that time Greek was the, was the lingua franca. Greek was the language that everybody was using because it was the language of trade, it was the language of commerce, it was the language of international diplomacy, so everybody would have been using Greek. But what it misses is the, is the Hebrew prohibition. If a Jewish man went into a Gentile home, he was unclean. Josephus, who was the probably the most cosmopolitan of the Jews of those days, said he could barely understand Greek and could hardly write in Latin. So why would Pilate go to the effort of writing this superscription in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. It's so that everybody knew, okay, the crime. And, and, and he, didn't even, he didn't even write his crime. He wrote the statement, this is the king of the Jews. And obviously the Pharisees and the scribes objected to that. But he wrote it in Greek and Latin and Hebrew so that everybody knew what was going on. If the Hebrews, if the Jews were that integrated, if they were that assimilated into the Hellenistic society, they would all be speaking Greek. He wouldn't need to write it in Hebrew. If the Roman soldiers, who'd obviously worked all over the, the Roman Empire, were that assimilated, if Greek was that ubiquitous as the language of the day, he wouldn't have needed to write it in Latin. He could have just written it in Greek. But the scripture says he wrote it in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. He wanted the visitors to read it, he wanted the Roman soldiers to read it, and he wanted the Jews to read it, because none of them were speaking each other's languages. Okay? So, that's another text. When people say, well, the, you know, the New Testament was written in Greek because that's what everybody spoke, that's nonsense. And this scripture gives you a good point to say, no, it wasn't written in Greek, it was written in Aramaic, and the Peshitta Aramaic New Testament has survived and corrects many errors in the Greek translation. Okay, so it's just a side point, but it is, this is a good scripture to help us get clarity and help us get to the truth of the scripture. So, 
having proven that Yehoshua fulfilled the requirements of the Messiah, let us look at what else he fulfilled. He filled he fulfilled many, many prophetic events on that day. So let's now turn back to the book of Exodus and let us look at just how much prophecy was fulfilled during that period leading up to and uh, being removed from the stake. So let's start in Exodus 12 and verse 1. Now Yehovah spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its entrails and its legs. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is Jehovah's Passover. And jumping down to verse 43. And Jehovah said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money. When you, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In the house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger dwells with you, and wants to keep the Passover to Jehovah, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. One law shall be for the native born, and for the stranger who dwells among you. Thus all the children of Israel did, as, Ye as Jehovah commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass on the very same day that Jehovah brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, according to their armies. So there's a couple of key points here. In verse 3 it says, Speaking to the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their father, a lamb for a house. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And in verse 46 it says, In one house shall it be eaten, thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh abroad of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So those are three pertinent points that we will look at now to see how Yehoshua fulfilled these points during his execution. So let's turn forward to one of the accounts of, the, of his execution. This time we'll go to the Gospel of John. And let us go to John chapter 12, and we will start in verse 1. John 12, starting in verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jehoshua came to Bethany, where Lazarus whom was whom had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jehoshua, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? 
This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used it to take what was and he used to take what was put in it. But Jehoshua said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you will not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jehoshua's sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jehoshua. The next day a great multitude that came out to the feast, when they heard that Jehoshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Jehovah, the King of Israel. Then Jehoshua, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now look at what they said in verse 13. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Jehovah, the King of Israel. And if you remember the superscription on the stake, what did Pilate write? The King of the Jews. So here we see that he is selected as the King of Israel, and at his execution it was identified that he had fulfilled that. And in verse 1 it says, then Jehoshua, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had, been, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And if you remember the study we did before Passover about the timing and the, the coordination of the New Testament and the Old Testament account, six days before the Passover, the Passover is late on the 14th day, six days before, so that means the Passover meal is on the 15th, six days before that would make it the 9th, so the day after is when he entered into Jerusalem and he came in on the 10th day of the month. And if you remember what we read in the book of Exodus, in Exodus it says, you shall choose, all Israel shall choose a lamb for themselves. And it says a great multitude were in Jerusalem saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of Jehovah, the King of Israel. So here we see Yehoshua when he entered Jerusalem fulfilled the very first part of the Passover process to be chosen by Israel as the lamb, as the Passover lamb. And we saw the superscription on his execution stake, the king of Israel. He fulfilled that selection. So let's look at other similarities between his execution and the various prophecies that surround the Messiah and the Passover. So let's go to Matthew 27 and we will start in verse 15. Matthew 27 starting in verse 15. Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at the time they had a notorious prisoner, a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Yehoshua, who is called Messiah? For we, we knew that he had handed him over because of, enemy, of en envy. When he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Yehoshua. The governor answered and said to them, Which of these two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What shall I do with Yehoshua, who is called Messiah? They all said to him, Let him be executed. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be executed. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jehoshua, he delivered him to be executed. 
Then the soldiers of the governor took Yehoshua into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his stake. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they executed him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jehoshua, the king of the Jews. Then the two robbers were executed with him, one on the right, another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of the mighty one, come down from the stake. Likewise the chief priest also, mocking, and the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the stake, and we will believe him. He trusted in the mighty one, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of the mighty one. Even the robbers who were executed with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour Yehoshua cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my mighty one, my mighty one, why have you spared me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, The man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The reed, the rest said, Let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come and save him. Then Yehoshua cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the set-apart city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him, who were guarding Yehoshua, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of the Mighty One. And many women who followed Yehoshua from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Yehoshua. The man went to Pilate and asked for the body of, Ye of Yehoshua. Then Pilate commanded the body be given to him. When Joseph had then had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb which had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how, that, how the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. <coughs> so that is the Matthew account of his execution. And let's look in here now at some of the key points from that account. Sorry, let's go now to Psalm 22 and look at how the account from Matthew crosses over and correlates 
with what we saw in the Psalms. So let's go to Psalm 22 and we will start in verse 1. And what I'd like to do is just count how many times through this process you hear in the Psalms exact fulfillment that we just read in the Gospel of Matthew. My mighty one, my mighty one, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my mighty one, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I am not silent, but you are set apart, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and they, and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridiculed me. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in Jehovah, let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while in my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from the earth. From my mother's womb you have been my mighty one. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So you see there that Psalm 22, which is prophetic about the execution of Yehoshua, was fulfilled almost in its entirety through what we read in the Gospel of Matthew. And let's just look at some of those key points. Verse 1, my mighty one, my mighty one, why hast thou forsaken me? In verse 6, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Verse 7, they laugh at me to scorn, they shoot the lip, they shake the head. Verse 8, he trusted in Jehovah that he would deliver him. Verse 16, for the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. 17. They all look and stare upon me. And verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Those were all prophetic statements from Psalm 22 which were fulfilled in that, par that, that passage from the Gospel of Matthew. So let's look at another prophetic scripture. This time let's turn to... Oops, sorry, verse, a couple more. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax and is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And thou hast brought me to the dust of death. All of these were, were explicitly fulfilled in the Matthew account of Yehoshua's execution. So now let's turn to another pro prophetic statement. This time we'll go to the prophet Isaiah. And let us see what Isaiah tells us about Yehoshua. Isaiah 53, and we will start in verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Jehovah been revealed? For he shall grow up before him a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by the Mighty One and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, 
and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the mast and, and Jehovah has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him, that he put him to grief. When you made his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and bore the sin of many, and made intercession for their transgression. So in Isaiah 53, in verse 2 it says, He shall grow before him as a tender plant, and out of root of dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And if you think about the scourging and, and the abuse that he took, he was a physical wreck even before he was put on the stake. In verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And we read in Matthew about how they all, the, the, the criminals, the, the soldiers, the Pharisees, the common people, all despised him at that time. <coughs> in verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and with his stripes we are healed. And we know that he was scourged and beaten in the praetorium before he was taken to the stake. In verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Um, as he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And if you recall, when he was being accused by the Pharisees and by the, the chief priests, he did not answer, he did not respond to their false accusations. So again, that was fulfilled. In verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And we saw that he was taken from the high priest, he was taken to the praetorium, to uh, Pilate for judgment, then he was taken to the garrison where he was held and beaten. So that scripture was fulfilled. In verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And remember, he was executed with two proven criminals, but buried in the grave, in the, in the fresh grave of a rich man. So again, these scriptures were literally fulfilled during the execution process. So, we have demonstrated very clearly from the scripture that Yehoshua is the Messiah. He met the requirements to be called Messiah. We saw that from the scripture, from the, uh, the gospel account in Matthew, and you can, you can cross-reference many more accounts to see this fulfillment. The two great prophecies of the Old Testament, Psalm 22, and Isaiah 53, both of those are fulfilled by Matthew, or, or, or declared fulfilled in Matthew. And so based on that, we can see that not only did Jehoshua meet the requirements of Messiah, he fulfilled the prophecies. And now as we, as we are on this Sabbath day, during this period of remembrance, there is another festival which is often overlooked, it is a festival that is not as well remembered as the other, but still one that we should be observing and one that a festival that we need to observe as well. So let's turn back to the book of Leviticus. And we'll go to Leviticus chapter 23 and we will start in verse 9. And Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, 
Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to Jehovah. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Jehovah, for a sweet aroma. It is a dr and its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of a hin. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought out an offering to your mighty one. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to Jehovah. So here we are talking about the wave sheaf offering. In verse 11 it says, And he shall wave the sheaf before Jehovah to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. So where we are this week, this, this event actually falls outside of the Days of Unleavened Bread. But there is no scriptural requirement that it actually falls inside this period. It just says, the morrow after the Sabbath. This is the, this is the first Sabbath we've had in this period. So tomorrow being the first day of the week, we would see the, uh, the wave sheaf offering. We would see the high priest go into the fields around Israel, cut a, a sheaf of barley and wave that as an offering before Jehovah. Now we've studied many times how Jehoshua fulfilled all the various high days. So did Jehoshua fulfill this requirement that he wave an offering before Jehovah? On the morrow after the Sabbath, he shall wave an offering before Jehovah to be accepted for you. Well, think, look at, looking at what we've just discussed, we said that he was resurrected on the Sabbath day, so the day after the Sabbath would be the first day of the week. Is there anything in Scripture that, that tells us that Yehoshua fulfilled this requirement of the wave sheaf offering? Let's turn back to the New Testament, and this time we will go to the Gospel of John. And we'll go to John chapter 20, and we will start in... verse 15. John 20 starting in verse 15. Yehoshua said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Yehoshua said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, that is to say, teacher. Yehoshua said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren, and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my mighty one and your mighty one. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the master, and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Yehoshua came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the master. So Yehoshua said to them again, Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the set-apart spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So what can we tell from that scripture? Well, in verse 17, it says this, Yehoshua said unto her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, ascend unto my, I ascend unto my father, and your father, and to my mighty one, and your mighty one. Now, who was he talking to? He was talking to Mary. When was he talking to her? Early on the morning, the first day of the week. This was just after she'd seen the empty tomb. 
So, Yehoshua, early on the morning of the first day of the week, had not ascended to his father. He told her not to touch him because she still had sin in her. He had come out of the grave, purified, ready to ascend to the Father, to carry the, the wave sheaf offering to the, heavenly, to the heavenly throne. And then we see a couple of verses later, in verse 19, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Yehoshua and stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And in verse 20 it says, And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Master. So if, they are sh if he is seeing, showing the disciples his hands and his side, do we think that they would have touched him? Almost certainly. And in fact, later on he said to Thomas, Put your hand in my side and put your, put your fingers in the holes in my hands. So during that period, he must have ascended between seeing Mary in the morning and coming to the disciples in the afternoon. It said it was the evening on the first day, so it's Sunday afternoon. He must have ascended to his father. Because in the morning he said, do not touch me, I have not yet ascended. And in the afternoon they were able to touch him. So sometime between those two meetings he ascended. The wave sheaf offering was cut on the Sunday morning and it was waved as an offering of the first fruits to Yehovah. So again we see that Yehoshua fulfilled the biblical requirement of the high day, he ascended to the Father, and he fulfilled that wave sheaf offering. So what does that mean to us? Well, let's look at how that affects us as children of Yehovah in the apostolic church in the time of the end. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll start in verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 20. But now Messiah is risen from the dead, and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And for as in Adam all die, even so in Messiah shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Messiah the firstfruits, Afterward, those who are messiahs at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of the mighty one, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says, all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, who put on all things under him, that the Mighty One may be all in all. So in verse 20 we're told, But now is Messiah risen from the dead, and has become the firstfruits of them that slept. And in verse 23, But every man in his own order, Messiah, the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Messiahs at his coming. So we can see that Messiah made the way for the first fruits. Brethren, we are the first fruits. We are those who are being called now. We are those who have accepted his calling, and we are those who have the right to enter in to the first resurrection. The first fruits of humanity. We are the first harvest, the small harvest. Those whose heart is right before Yehovah those who he welcomes to be his children, to be numbered amongst the first fruits, and those who will be with Messiah at his return to rebuild creation the way Yehovah intended it to be. So let us close this study with one more scripture, and let's look right to the end, to future history. We know these things will happen just as sure as they have happened. We know that Yehovah will not be denied. We know that the future history is, is firm. So let us look at what he tells us about the time of the end. Revelation 14, and we will start in verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, 
and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These are redeemed from men, first fruits to the Mighty One and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of the Mighty One. <coughs> so in verse 4 it says, These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to the Mighty One and to the Lamb. So brethren, let us fulfill our position as first fruits. Let us fulfill our calling and our ministry, and let us follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Amen.